also teach religion, psychology, and modern literature in the um, <laughs> Well, I thought we could do is after everything's introduced and everything, we put the light on this for three oh. minutes and nine seconds. Okay, and then put them on. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. We're happy to be here. We're happy you're here. And well, happy. my name's Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> this is Natalie, and this is the PCC Forum. All right. And a little bit about Jason. So Jason is a professor of philosophy at Seattle University. He works and teaches in the areas of Buddhist philosophy, aesthetics, continental philosophy, and environmental philosophy. And his recent books include Nietzsche and Other Buddhas, and The Great Earth, Reading Gary Snyder, and Dojin and the Age of Ecological Crisis. He is currently completing a manuscript on the cinema of Terence Malick. There was way more, so I'm sure you can <laughs> touch a lot more on the work that you do. <laughs> I want this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. We're going to turn the lights off for three minutes and eight seconds. Oh. <laughs> I guess that turned the power off. <laughs> the projector. Oh. That switch, um, yeah, the switch turned off the power to the projector. <laughs> oh, man. So much for drama. <laughs> this too is the tree of life. So as everyone um, gets ready for the screen to come on, I know Brian is a state who has not seen the film. Has everybody else seen it? I just saw it on Tuesday for the first time. What you think? It was very interesting. I saw it with a new friend. And we were both left and being like, no way. I, I was yeah. happy that this event's happening. Good. Yeah. You can say that I haven't seen that film before it's would be a, would be a very fair is. response. Yeah. It's beautiful to experience. Yeah. This film has not been made before. Not even by Malik. How about just with that? Okay. <laughs> so Happy medium. So, that yeah, it should flip on in a sec. Have you watched him? I'm sure you've watched him on movies. This film? Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen it? <laughs> yeah, um, about 15 times. Wow. Yeah. Have you seen the extended version? I have seen the extended version. Nice. I highly recommend the extended version. Here we go. It's like two yeah. Extra 50 minutes, five yeah. zero. You guys ready? Who's the sound?
anybody recognize that piece of music? Lacrimosa is what she's singing. Anybody recognize that term? It's from the Catholic funeral. Lacrimosa is the point in the funeral where you weep to the dead. It's too hard, too painful. I find it very interesting that uh, Lacrimosa is the sequence that, or is the music that's accompanying uh, Brian Schwimm's world. This is Malik's answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? This is the genesis of being as such, and we're weeping for the dead. So that's a very powerful image already. So anyway, I prepared some comments tonight on this very remarkable film. I had meant it to be very provocative to get a good conversation. They're a little bit lengthy too, so if you get sick of me, just go like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. So this evening, I would like to consider the relationship between idea and image by way of a philosophical consideration of what I consider to be the central cinematic problem at the core of Terrence Malick's groundbreaking film, The Tree of Life. How to create an image of the divine that simultaneously reveals a divinity of the image as such. Most films that have, that, that have resorted to anything religious, so all you do is fill in your list of worst films you ever saw. Uh, so think, for example, the idolatrous excesses in religious ideology like the Ten Commandments, uh, or Jesus of Nazareth, or the worst films I ever saw in my life, The Passion of the Christ, uh, or The Howler, the greatest story ever told. You figure, wow, it's never, ever go that direction in cinema. Um, these films were content to represent or illustrate with overweening piety the well-worn and received ideas about what matters in religion. And to be fair, religion itself is increasingly a contested and opaque word as we grapple with the history and iniquities that its institutions have wrought. We hardly know today how to think in any kind of productive way about such an idea. Malick's film in its own way has also flabbergasted and divided most critics as they struggle to say anything halfway intelligent about it. And it deftly avoids the idolatry of religious cinematic thinking. That is, it refuses altogether the task of representing God and the realm of religious experience, while it also avoids doctrinal issues altogether, even demonstrating a thoroughgoing and programmatic disinterest in them. Nonetheless, Malik's work is deeply religious, albeit in a philosophically and artistically subtle and profound sense of what such a claim could possibly mean. Malik's films, like his religiosity, are moreover not conspicuously philosophical because he is first and foremost cinematically presenting religious experience. Although it is also clear that he does think philosophically about such things. I mean, Malik's early training, as most of you know, was as a philosopher, and he could have gone on to be a very famous philosopher. He met Heidegger, translated Heidegger. <clears throat> Malik's cinema, however, is not philosophy, not his, not someone else's. It's not philosophy by other means. So let's now do philosophy as a movie. That makes the second class a really bad movie. So the worst is religious movies. The second are movies about philosophy, which are these people running around screaming at each other about philosophical arguments to see profound. It's just exhausting. I mean, you want that just be quiet, read a book, it's nice, no one's screaming at you. Um, yeah, how do you think? It? it does not present discursive arguments, does not illustrate philosophical themes. And as Malik said in 1975, I don't feel one can film philosophy. Now, this is when he's still, you know, a Heidegger scholar also. Philosophical thought about the religious dimensions of human experience 
is formalic translated and transformed into a uniquely cinematic manner of thinking. I really want to get at it tonight. I mean, how do you think cinematically? It is his cinematic solutions to such problems that produce what Robert Sinnerbrick felicitously called Malick's cinematic thinking. It is the character of this relevance to cinematic thinking and thinking as we know it in philosophy that here concerns me, especially in its religious dimension. The great Andre Tarkovsky, is that a concept to everyone in this room? People know Tarkovsky cinema. If you don't, you should. Oh man, oh man, it's a good reason to be born. You can say, wow, my life's falling apart, but I saw a Tarkovsky film, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> He's that kind of director. Tarkovsky is huge for Malik. And if you know Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky was one of the absolute best at trying to do deeply, transformatively, change your life like the best book wants to change your life, but doing it by adhering to what only cinema can do, by unleashing the deepest powers of uniquely cinematic thought. Uh, so Tarkovsky, to whose cinema Malik's The Tree of Life has clear resonances. What do you mean, Worth? Well, think, for example, the central motif of Alexander and Little Man planting a tree of life, planting a tree in the sacrifice. It's the light motif of the whole film. You plant a tree whose fruit will not be present in your lifetime as the whole world, like ours, uh, falls apart. This Tarkovsky claimed, and I quote, that in creating an image, an artist subordinates her own thought, which becomes insignificant in the face of that emotionally perceived image of the world that has appeared to him like a revelation. For thought is brief, whereas the image is absolute. Not idolatrous. Idolatry gives you bad films. That's uh, in Tarkovsky's masterpiece book. He wrote a really brilliant book called Sculpting in Time. You know it's going to be a good book with a title like that, Sculpting in Time. This led Tarkovsky to draw an analogy between the potency of an artistic image and a purely religious experience. The image as such, whether or not it presents anything explicitly religious, is, when successful, already analogous to religious experience. Images, Tarkovsky writes, are, and I quote, governed by the dynamic of revelation. It's a question of sudden flashes of illumination, like scales falling from the eyes. Not in relation to the parts, however, but to the whole, to the infinite, to what does not fit into any conscious thought. But that's not a Hollywood movie. Hollywood does not try to do that. Hollywood is not saying, I want, to, I want you to experience, analogous to religious experience, a revelation of that which cannot fit into any conscious thought. No, no. They barely think at all, and when they do, it's at the dumbest level. <clears throat> the image is not concerned with illustrating some idea, Tarkovsky goes on to say, but is rather, and I love this phrase, now his, Tarkovsky's father was one of Russia's most famous poets. The image is rather a hieroglyphic of absolute truth. It also could have been a holderly line. And Zeichen sind für Deutungslos. We're a sign that points nowhere. You know, it's a mysterious sign that you cannot interpret, but it's everything is in it. Such that through the image is sustained an awareness of the infinite the eternal within the finite, the spiritual within matter, the limitless given form. How, the, how do my fellow Buddhists say it? Oh, Shariputra, have you not heard? Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. That's the secret to the image. Images do not somehow represent the absolute, 
<clears throat> but rather each image in its own singular manner expresses the absolute. What makes an image an image does not reduce to what it is literally an image of, and the art of this kind of cinema is to produce a new and anti-ideological mythology grounded in the epiphany of the revelatory power of the image. And when you watch Malik, of course, the more you get steeped into his film, anything that appears, you don't, it's on the spectrum, which you have. so here is, of course, can you imagine the unimaginable, which is why there is something rather than nothing. So the Big Bang to a funeral lacrimosa, the cause of all our joy and suffering, or in a seagull. Dogen once said, even a mote of dust is enough to turn the Dharma wheel. All of it becomes the religiosity of the image. Each thing that it films is revealing what it is for the image to have imagined. <clears throat> Hence, uh, Tarkovsky was on to say, the image is like a monad. All the Leibniz students recognize that. Saying in its singular and irreducible way, the inexhaustibility of what it paradoxically reveals. So no two images reveal in the same way. Yet all images reveal, each in their own way. <clears throat> this is the paradox from Malik and Tarkovsky of creativity as such. Discovering what has not yet been. That's what you do in art. It is the shock, Tarkovsky's term, or for Malik, the grace of the image that asks, as does the adult Jack O'Brien in the Tree of Life, how did you come to me? In what shape? What disguise? It was always there. You know, the, those who have read St. Augustine uh, will recognize that when Malik takes a source, he <clears throat> deeply repurposes it. But this is really also Augustine at his best. It was always there, and everything was saying. The universe was prolix with revelation. That's hard to get to. You know, there has to be that image that allows us to experience the power of images as such. You know, in what shape? What disguise? Like the early Augustine, another line from Tree of Life, I didn't know how to name you then. At the end of his life, after a deep religious awakening, Tolstoy spoke of art's power of infection, such that the evolution of feelings takes place by means of art, replacing lower feelings, less kind and less needed for the good of humanity, by kinder feelings, more needed for that good. This is the purpose of art. If you all remember, that's why Tolstoy said, Anna Karenina, War and Peace, junk, forget about it. Read my religious essays. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Tarkovsky and Malik are less convinced that art has quite this kind of power. And it is not the task of art to preach about how we should live. Tolstoy's most famous spiritual essay. What we should then do. <clears throat> That's not Tarkovsky and Malik. For Tarkovsky art nonetheless has the power of shock and catharsis. In themselves, artistic images and other works cannot make us good, but they can awaken us from the profanity of our lives of quiet desperation and make us Tarkovsky's phrase, receptive to good. Indeed, for Tarkovsky, art in its own way does what Plato in the Phaedo claims for philosophy in its own way. You know, students are always really amazed. You know, what was Plato up to? Epistemology, or form metaphysics, or ethics? Well, he only once actually tells you what philosophy is. Preparation for dying. That's all philosophy is. We, for your own death, Tarkovsky. 
The aim of art <clears throat> is to prepare a person for death. Aim of Tree of Life. It is a film about life. The price of admission. Prepare to die. Prepare a person for death to plow and harrow her soul, rendering it capable of turning to good. In one of his only interviews conducted this year, four decades ago, among his very last interviews, uh, Malik um, made the same point, and I quote Malik, for an hour or for two days or longer, these films can enable small changes of heart, changes that mean the same thing, to live better, to love more. Malik wrote nothing like Tarkovsky's remarkable book and has conscientiously and contractually avoided all public discourse. Yet Malik's silence speaks volumes and his careful constellations of cinematic images and soundscapes speak more eloquently, eloquently than the reduction to any possible set of philosophical theses. They form the cinematic enactment of a new mythology of the restoration of Eden. This is a crazy claim, I'll try to parse it out, but that's been Malik's theme in every single film, the restoration of Eden. If Eden didn't go away that we fell from it, as in we couldn't see that we were in Eden. Eden was not hiding. We couldn't see who we were and what we had. A healing of our relationship to the earth and our way of being upon it. You know, Malik's films always have all these characters always working with the earth. To the Wonder, for example, uh, the main character is what uh, Linda calls in uh, Days of Heaven, a mud doctor. And he looks to see what the petroleum industry in Oklahoma is doing to the soil, constantly looking at the soil. As Marcel Chion has astutely remarked, Malik's films all seem to speak of an earthly paradise that is at once lost, yet ever present. In part, our relationship to nature is broken because we suffer, sometimes horribly, and all that lives is born to die. A favorite line from Being in Time, that little footnote about the Bohemian peasant. As soon as you are born, you're old enough to die. That makes us crazy. Religion that reacts to the brokenness of our relationship to nature, that we have fallen from Eden, forgotten the Buddha lands, imagines that it can solve this problem by denying the ultimate existence of pain, suffering, evil, and death. In heaven, we are told, we find only the parts of the earth that we like, and an infinite and imperishable supply. Just suffer through this thing with a pure heart and get to the real life, which is always elsewhere, provoking Nietzsche to quip and beyond good and evil that, a will has dominated. Ooh, lost my feet. No. Has dominated Europe for 1,800 years. That wants to make everything a sublime miscarriage. Oops! I don't know what God was doing. Oh man, he was on a bender. Well, just hold your nose and get through it. It'll be better, I promise. You know, like you just. I just, I, well, I had the best intentions, but I just, I don't know. I just flashed those on the first day. I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Wittgenstein, another of Malik's own early philosophical inspirations, demoted the doctrine, I always love this argument, demoted the doctrine of predestination to the status of pain language, more akin to screaming ouch when you step on a nail than to metaphysics. This is just crazy, you know, that all of our bills on come up with crazy ideas. It just, it hurts so much. <clears throat> this kind of religion is a desperate magical thinking that attempts to solve the problem of pain 
on the term set by pain. That is, it responds to the problem of pain by acting in ways that preserve and even enhance the pain. Predestination just, that's just pouring salt in our wounds. The pain of our inability to affirm life on its own terms drives us to the kind of religion that sublimely institutionalizes, reinforces, and preys upon this refusal. Martin Sheen, star of Malick's first film, Badlands, and a radical Catholic activist, probably didn't know that about him, he's a really big deal. He goes every single year to the School of Americas to protest. Um, you know, he, uh, during the, the Apocalypse Now period, you know, he had a nervous breakdown, his whole life fell apart. He was very, very suicidal. He moved to Paris where Malik was living. Uh, Malik was a 20 year period off for not making any films. And you know, Sheen was at the end of his life. And Malik came up to him and says, okay, it's been, you do this and you will live. Well, what was this? How did Malik save Martin Sheen's life such that not only did he need to live, he becomes this very generous, very radical Catholic activist. I love his answer. He gave him a copy of the Brothers Karamazov. That was his answer. You get to the bottom of that book. You get yourself attuned to that book and you break through. <clears throat> Sheen required, or recalls, it had a very profound effect on my spiritual life. And this was like the final door that I had to go through. You see, any Malik film, but especially a tree of life, doorways and passageways are ubiquitous. We did notice and say, next time I watch one, I'm going to pay attention to doorways and count them. You'll stop at 50, you'll get tired constantly doorways and passageways. You know, that sequence when they go into the uh, Mono Lake Desert uh, at the end of the Tree of Life. Uh, remember, Martin Sheen walks through a doorway. No wall. Just walks through a doorway. <clears throat> Malik's production designer, Jack Fisk, recalls, Jack Fisk works on every single film except for the one that's coming out now, The Rotted Room. Fisk also worked on every single David Lynch film. And David Lynch and Malik went to school together. And they both consider themselves religious filmmakers. In both, you can't really say, oh, I know what religion is such that I can see what makes Malik or David Lynch religious. They lost highway. You know, David Lynch says, yeah, yeah, this is my spiritual devotion, like, like an act of praying. Jack Fisk recalls Malik had always loved gates. I believe gates and doors are passages into another world, another part of our lives. One of Malik's principal camera operators and a brilliant cinematographer, Jörg Wittmer, recalls that during the shooting of the Tree of Life, we are always literally crossing borders. The Tree of Life is about crossing borders and crossing spaces getting out of something into the light. Stairs, ladders, going up to heaven, or going into something. These are always the philosophical elements of his movies. Brothers Karamazov, you know, the production company of Malik, I don't know if you ever noticed this, is buried in the, cred in the credits. Brothers K Productions. Hmm. That's really interesting. The Brothers Karamazov itself is hardly a defense of religious practice as usual. It powerfully contrasts the grace of Iosha with the Job-like recriminations of Ivan, who rebels against creation and advocates for the Grand Inquisitor, who, upon learning of the return of Jesus, condemns him to death so that institutional religious control over the scandal of creation, including the barbarism of the human, can continue. We have religion, so we will not be ourselves. To crush us and keep us in place. A regime of fear and intimidation. 
Yvonne's anguish is mirrored in the Inquisitor's willful deployment of Satan's three temptations that Jesus resists in the desert. But all religion for the Grand Inquisitor is the three things that Jesus said it was not. Miracles. So every time someone asks you a good rational question, you say, it's a miracle. It'll just happen. I have cancer. What am I going to do? Pray. It'll go away. That's your solution. Religion. Or that was, remember that was Satan said, how about that? No. Two, uh, mystery. This doesn't make any sense. It's a mystery. God works in mysterious ways. As in, you have, the only way religion is to be stupid. <clears throat> and every time someone starts saying, well, wait a minute, it doesn't add up, they start saying, wow, the problem comes back. How is creation not a scandal? Why is our fundamental mode, the reason why there is something rather than nothing is the same reason why we can't stop crying? What's your answer to that? If you say, the answer is, if you believe cancer goes away, or you just turn your brain off and say, it's all good. Or the third, remember the third temptation, power. You bring out the sword and they disagree, put them in the Inquisition. You've missed the problem. But you do have the history of a lot of institutional acts of religion all over the world, not just in the Western ones. The, Inquis the Inquisitor corrected Dostoevsky's term, Jesus' deed, and used institutional violence to prevent us from giving in to our deplorable natures and facing a world that we cannot bear. And the power in contrast of Jesus and Iosha, the vulnerable, wholly exposed, wholly unprotected kiss. Remember, Jesus gets up, he kisses the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor is the God damn it, get out of here. This kiss was all he could do. That was his answer. And then Iosha, remember, he kisses Yvonne. You bastard, you cheated. I can't do it. What is this kiss? This tension, Jesus and the Grand Inquisitor, Iosha and his broken-hearted and betrayed brother, Ivan, repeatedly plays itself out in Malik's work. It's everywhere from the very first film. The Thin Red Line, for example, it is the relationship between First Sergeant Welsh, the Sean Penn character, who thinks that one should become an island and leave no flank of life exposed to the Earth's ceaseless enemy attacks. And on the other side, Wit, the Jim Cabotseal character, who saw a spark in Welsh, and who died so that his men could live. In the Tree of Life, it is the tension between Mrs. O'Brien, which is the Jessica Chastain character, the Way of Grace, and her husband, Brad Pitt, the way of nature. Mrs. O'Brien sounds like Zosima in the uh, Brothers Karamazov when she counsels, and in the extended version of the film, this is repeated several times. Unless you love, your life will flash by. You'll miss it. I mean, this is the problem. Can we love it? Not can we escape it. Can we love it? That's the supreme religious problem for Dostoevsky, Tarkovsky, Malik. Flash you by and you will lose it. So she counsels two times in the extended version. Love everything. Love every leaf. Every drop of rain. In the beginning of the film, against the soundtrack of John Taverner's funeral canticle. So the three dramatic sections of the film, just so if you haven't noticed, all three are funeral music. The entire film follows the structure of the funeral mass. So creation, of course, the lacrimosa. All of it is too much. The Big Bang is the big screw you. 
uh, the scandal, the birth of the scandal. And remember the satanic character in, in, in Dostoevsky. He's always the one. He never rebelled against God. That's uninteresting and boring. Rebellion is against creation. And this never should have been. It's Job. And for Malik, of course, I mean, the entire Tree of Life, of course, it is a deep Dostoevskyan meditation on the book of Job and Job's question. You know, is this worthy of my love? And Job sits in the pit having lost everything. You know, all he asks for is, since I didn't die in the womb, since I didn't die in childbirth, since I didn't die in youth, so I didn't die as an early adult. Let me die now. That's all I want. And what Yvonne says, ticket's too much. I want out. I'm turning the ticket back. That's rebellion. That's the problem of rebellion. So against the soundtrack of John Taverner's funeral canticle, which was made for, for uh, Taverner wrote that for the death of his own teacher. And the Lacrimosa, you know, that um, by Presner, that was written for his death of his best friend, Kislowski, the great Polish filmmaker. You know, Kislowski uh, went in for uh, a heart operation. They kept saying to him, you, know, you can't have a heart operation in Poland. They can't they'll kill you. You know, go to the United States. The great Kislowski, you know, you know, blue, white, and red, double life of Veroni, who was working on a new trilogy on the Divine Comedy. You know, it was going to be awesome. And you, can't, you can't do this. No, I'm Polish. I'm a Polish person, I'll go to a Polish doctor. And he died stupidly. No way he would have died had he gone to even Western Europe. And this is the piece that Presner wrote for the death of his best friend. Presner does the music for all of Kislowski's film. And here he is trying to let go of his beloved friend. And Tavener, of course, the music has the same origin. So against the background of Tavener, funeral canticle. Mrs. O'Brien is a young girl admiring cows in a pasture. So again, the contrast between the music and the movement of the generosity and grace of Mrs. O'Brien. She says, and these lines are almost already now part of the public discourse. The nuns taught us there are two ways through life. The way of nature and the way of grace. You have to choose which one you'll follow. Grace doesn't try to please itself, accepts being slighted, forgotten, disliked, accepts insults and injuries. Nature only wants to please itself, get others to please it too, likes to lord it over them, to have its own way. It finds reasons to be unhappy, when all the world is shining around it, when love is smiling through all things. They taught us that no one who loves the way of grace ever comes to a bad end. I will be true to you, whatever comes. Now, this sequence in the film is so brilliant. Cut to her receiving the telegram of the death of her son. And that scene is so brilliant, no sound at all, and then suddenly, as if erupting from silence itself, the animal cries of absolute mourning. Mrs. O'Brien's description of grace and nature sounds familiar, it does sound familiar. Uh, no one reads these things anymore. Um, but it was once upon a time, it would have been very famous, actually. It's a very, very famous work in the Catholic canon. Is lifted really word for word from the imitation of Christ, uh, where the 15th century German-Dutch canon regular Thomas of Kempis wrote that, grace doesn't try to please itself, except being slighted, forgotten, disliked. Um, Jessica Chastain recalls her own process working on this character with Malik. Malik was, and I repeat, looking for something universal from my character, something out of time, a kind of love that didn't, didn't serve her, a kind of love that was only for others. 
Prepare, chastain, recollect. She did a ton of calming gratitude meditation. And I quote again, would try and envision opening my heart to the world. This flower, this kiss, this absolute vulnerability, totally unprotected. Yet the flower is crushed by the wind. Kindness is destroyed by the bullet. Like her son, R.L., who commits suicide at an early age, Mrs. O'Brien has all the power and fragility of a kiss a kind word, Malik sunflowers blowing in the wind. She will be crushed. To be crushed by death is the way of all things, tyrants and flowers alike. Yet as she howls and weeps, she only wants, and I quote her, to die and be with her son. Her husband, Mr. O'Brien, on the other hand, is the power of nature, which Kempis tells us, always wants to have its own way. He tells his boys that it takes a fierce will to get ahead. Indeed, apropos of the American dream and the devastation of the earth, you make yourself what you are. You have control of your own destiny. Like Ahab amidst, amidst the infinite and placeless sea, Mr. O'Brien experienced it, the sea, the life, the world, the earth, creation, as an immense desert, an endless lack and cheat. Now the desert in the history of Christianity is very, very important. Remember, that's also where you find the rebel, Satan the rebel, always in the desert. In the film itself, you remember when the Job quote begins at the very, very beginning, there's no music, but there is sound. The sound of what? Water. The desert seeking the water of life. <clears throat> There's an immense desert, an endless lack and cheat. Nature is regard for temporal wealth and rejoices in earthly gains. It is sad over a loss and irritated by a slight injurious word, Thomas Akempis tells us. Driving ruefully past the mansions of the wealthy, endlessly patenting his ideas, always waiting and hoping for the big break that would confirm that he was not nothing, losing again in court, callously being fired from his job, I never missed a day of work, and being offered a new job that nobody wants, fighting violently with his wife and his children, he is a kind of Texas Willie Lowman from the uh, death of a salesman. <clears throat> With no control, look, always looking for control of his destiny, but a complete worldly failure. A nobody in Nowheresville, Texas town, uh, Waco in the film, but filmed in Smithville largely. He is invisible to the grand march of history and winners. In the extended version of the film, we encounter his father, but not at all the theatrical version, missing character entirely. <clears throat> who his son, um, having lost one of his own sons to suicide, ruefully reflects, I took my father for granted. I thought he was weak. He worked tirelessly without success until he was finally destroyed. Nature has a deep predilection for fairness. My father did not get what he deserved. He was used by this system and then spit out as garbage. Later, his son concludes that the world lives by trickery. If you want to succeed, you can't be too good. That's his response to all this. It's too horrible. If you leave yourself open, you get screwed. Look at my father. He gave everything and got nothing. I do everything, and I get screwed again and again and again and again. Why leave yourself open? After seeing a boy drown, his oldest son, so the Jack O'Brien character, speaking to the sky, spitefully concludes, why should I be good if you aren't? Why should we be good if life is shit? 
It's going to screw us. Why shouldn't we screw everyone we see then? To be clear, nature's position, like Ivan Karamazov's estimation of life as not being worth the price of admission, is not unreasonable. It is outraged by the presence of injustice as if it were an argument against the way of all things. I mean, this is Job's position, remember. Rational analysis would show us that life is fundamentally unjust. You know, students, when you teach the the, uh, the Plato's Republic, that famous beginning in part two, when Thrasymachus is unleashing, you know, I mean, this good guy does nothing wrong at all, and, you know, he's falsely arrested, tortured, destroyed, but he lives a just life. Do you think he's happier than the guy who, you know, President of the United States lived a whole life of rampant criminality. You, you think Donald Trump's sad and the just person languishing in jail is like, I'm so happy. You really think that? The origins of the vice grip of nature begin early, as they did with Augustine confessing his sins even as a baby. Remember that? So young, so full of sin. What was this sin? I wanted extra milk for my mother's breast. So in the film, and this is some, it's in the theatrical, some in the extended version. Mrs. O'Brien firmly telling, so in the extended version, you see the life as babies also. Um, Mrs. O'Brien firmly telling her son, no. The first no. The young child grabbing a piece of cake imperiously declaring, it's mine. Troubles again. <laughs> Mrs. O'Brien shielding her child's eyes from a random scene of violence. That's Buddha, right? I'll raise my child right by building a wall around him. We'll never see sickness, old age, and death. Mr. O'Brien drawing an invisible lie in the grass over which one should not cross. Oh, don't eat from a tree, you say. A beautiful butterfly lying in the grass, and then a hungry cat eyeing it. Suddenly seeing a three legged dog play like all the rest, but it's got three legs. How's it live with itself? Seeing your mother, seeing it in the extended version, subtle but powerful. Seeing your mother bleed after cutting her hand badly in a kitchen accident, and then the sudden epiphany as a child, will you die too? Playing on the graves in the cemetery, sickness, old age, suffering, death. I quote Jack O'Brien as a child. Can it happen to anyone? No one talks about it. Welcome to religion. No one is wholly marked by either grace or nature, however. Mrs. O'Brien howls in grief upon receiving the news of her son's suicide and would rather die than be among the cows and sunflowers. Mr. O'Brien is not without self-knowledge and regret. He momentarily realizes that his son not only were the only good he had ever done, but that they were enough. So enough to have had these three children. Why did I beat my child up based on how he turned the pages on my organ? To quote the great line in Mr. O'Brien's film, I wanted to be loved because I was a great man. Now I'm nothing. Look at the world around us, the trees and birds. I lived in shame. I dishonored it all and didn't notice the glory. A foolish man. At this point, of course, any lover of goes, yeah, okay. Yeah. Trees and the birds. Wait a minute, that's Zosima's brother, remember? When he's dying of cancer. Yeah, this is the teaching that Zosima gave to Iosha that changed his life. As he's dying of cancer, he goes to the window, he opens it up, and he apologizes to the birds. I live my life without appreciating you. Everyone goes, man, oh man, this sick so he's making him crazy, we all think. No, total clarity. Look at my own death, and I realize 
I betrayed the birds. Her eldest son, Jack O'Brien, the Hunter McCracken, Sean Penn character, feels the two possibilities warring within himself. Mother, father, always you wrestle inside me, always you will. This is the battle within us between water and the desert, affirmation and lamentation. As a child, he recognizes that he is more like his father. I am more like you than like her. And this begins with what he regards as the injustice in having such a hypocritical and controlling father. He's most like his father. Why? I want to do what I want, he says in defiance and praise to God. Please, God, kill him. My father like son. The film abounds with images of youthful willfulness, and these, signs, uh, these scenes are multiplied in the extended cuts blowing up birds' eggs with firecrackers, tying a frog to a skyrocket and firing it off, throwing rocks from an abandoned window, fighting and taunting each other, coaxing R.L. after the one who grows up and commits suicide, coaxing R.L. to put his finger at the end of a barrel of a BB gun so the jack can fire it, even sneaking away to steal his comely neighbor's underwear. Yet Jack, when he grows up, has succeeded where his hapless father has not. He is a successful architect in a shiny Texas urban office building, lives in a beautiful house, wears Armani suit, but he has not forgotten his childhood, his mother, his anguished father, and the fragile, powerful innocence of his brother R.L., whose suicide is announced at the beginning of the film. He is still mourning for them, for himself, and as he, the sequence with him as it begins, <clears throat> he lights a ritual candle as unreconciled memories of his childhood and the death of his brother involuntarily return. This whole sequence of childhood, this is not like, oh, I remember when I was a child, I did this, and I did that. This is the logic of trauma. This is a film about trauma. This is the trauma of the pit. These memories are not optional. They're not elective. You know, when you lose someone, you don't just remember how you felt losing them. You can't forget what you lost. That's the trauma of loss. It keeps coming back. All the things you did together, good and bad. And so, as these memories begin again, he begins by lighting a candle. The lacrimosa, the part of the funeral. How am I going to find the grace to accept what's happened when I experience it as unacceptable down to the very core of my unconscious? Mourning, I would say then, mourning for Malik is the war between grace and nature. Father, you, father and mother. Still you fight in me. That's mourning. You know, if we were pure grace, you know, like, oh, uh, yeah, whole family's dead. Oh, amen. Life is good. It's all a miracle. It's all a mystery. Like, no one lives like that. You know I mean, there is a, what's so powerful about Malik and Dostoevsky in the book of Job is they don't say, oh, by the way, this deep lamentation in the pit is irrational, stupid, pathological. It's deeply religious. It is the struggle for grace. Struggle for grace already as you struggle to be able to affirm what is. Everyone can affirm the flowers and the butterflies. If we were pure grace, we would love everything but be attached to nothing. If we were pure nature, we could not let go of anything and would eventually be crushed by the weight of memory and its catalog of scandals and injustices. We mourn at funerals as grace gives nature its due, but endeavors 
nonetheless to have the final word. That's the funeral mythology. Um, is there a final word for grace as grace gives nature its due? The struggle within memory between nature and grace, traumatic involuntary recollection, and acceptance of loss as Jack O'Brien struggles to come to terms with the suicide of his brother, is not the wound of memory, the recurrence of a past event that one cannot accept, the lingering presence also then of Job's lament, that life itself is not acceptable, that given what it has revealed itself to be, it should not have been. Ivan Karamazov, even Ayosha, as he struggles with his teacher's putrefaction, remember his teacher died and he starts stinking. And he, <laughs> so some of the holiest man ever. And his, his putrefaction is so horrible that all the monks are running from the room. Ayosha walks around and goes, even Zosima? Even him? You do this to his body? There was not even any flesh on his body. You look like the devil. I am the rebel, Yosha says. How could this be acceptable? It is creation itself that is found wanting. The tree of life. The tree of life itself, which resonates in the sacred writings of all the peoples of the book and in many other traditions, was planted in the Garden of Eden along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2.9. The fruit of the latter tree led to the fall from nature and the direction of life into the good and acceptable on the one hand and the evil, deplorable, abject, and detestable on the other hand. So it's the birth of nature in Malik's lexicon. In the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelations, however, this curse that our lives and life itself or more than we can fully bear, is lifted. Eden, that is, the unconditional affirmation of all of nature. That's all it is. I live in the Buddha land. My life, just as it is, is restored. Passage in the book of Revelations is key, I think, because this is the malice mythology. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Now, if you remember in the Tree of Life, it's always water, waterfalls, little goldfish swimming around the water, showers, water falling in the drains, you know, lakes, water, water, water. The angel showed me the river of the water of life. The very opening sound, the sound of moving water. The very last sound in the film, moving water, seagulls, the birds. Osama's brothers, apology of the birds, over the water of life. As clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of nations. Tarkovsky, Malik, you know, this is the moment in which you're pulled out of yourself, pulled out of your pain. No longer will there be any curse. So that, I think, is the source for Malik of the tree of life. Now, not the tree of good and evil, but the tree by which the healing of life is cursed and diremptive, is lifted. The tree of life and the water that makes it possible, no water, no life in any real sense of the word, is not the fantasy that there is only life. Driven from the affirmation of nature by death, pain, and suffering, there is now a healing of this wound. Malik is in no way a Gnostic denigrating the shining of the earth as somehow fallen and evil and calling for its escape. It is humans who are fallen, not the earth. 
nor in the end is he a dualist. The latter is precisely the problem of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which knowingly divides the earth into the ontologically distinct duality of good and evil. That being said, this is precisely where we always begin. The division of the earth into the bearable and the unbearable. And then you roll the dice because you know the unbearable. If you're unlucky, it wins right from the beginning. If you're lucky, just wait. The radical anamnesis of nature, the remembering of its fall and internal scission, Holdelin's on Denken, Heidegger's call to the remembrance of the ontological difference is a huge motif in all of Malick's films. His private train muse at the beginning of the thin red line. What is this war in the heart of nature? Why does nature vie with itself? The land, the land contests, contests with the sea. Is there an avenging power in nature? Not one power, but two. Light and darkness contest each other, yet are inseparably intertwined with each other. So Malick's film, another thing that's very striking about them, is they use almost no artificial light. So even the scenes in darkness, they're only lit by the candles in the film. There's no other lighting. <clears throat> the only time in artificial lighting, and this is really rich, is when they're in the office buildings in Houston. Okay, there you go. There's the fall right there. The office buildings in Houston, which, by the way, all have these poor trees living inside these buildings, struggling, and all the light is just artificial and constant. You know, pure nature light. Pure light as domination. Pure light as pure light as in this is light on demand. All other light in the film is not on demand. All other light in the film, inside or outside, is light that is available. Check it out, you'll see. In addition to the glimmering of light against the darkness, flames burning against the absence of light, a crepuscular sun filtering through the trees, the bright and seemingly unyielding sun illuminating our memories of youth, Malik deploys frequent images of the river of the water of life as clear as crystal. There are the ferocious waterfalls, as well as water flowing into the sink from the faucet. Life itself emerges from the water, and children play in the water. Remember in the creation scene, it ends. It's really an amazing scene. With Jack O'Brien coming into the world, and how is that depicted? It's a little baby in a room, and the room is full of water, and he swims to the top of the water, and there's a door. Another one of the mint, countless passageways. As he swims to the door, cut to. There's Mrs. O'Brien on the table, and they're pulling the baby out of the womb. I mean, out of the water of life. The sea teems with creatures. The local river flows. The family has a goldfish in the bowl. You can't see this little goldfish swimming in the water. And, you know, I don't know if I want to be a goldfish in the water, but, you know, Dogen says, you know, for fish, water is their palate. You know, it's what gives them their being. It's their life. <clears throat> Yet water is also interfused with ruin and death. Think already. Lacrimosa, Big Bang. <clears throat> a young boy drowns while swimming in Barton Springs. A pleosaur bleeds on the beach while another dinosaur lies dying in the stream. The hammerheads and sea snakes are not vegans any more so than the raptor that lets the dinosaur die in relative peace. In the most quietly sublime image in the film, so quietly sublime, so utterly devastating, it's easy to miss. The immense superfauna and biotic extravagance of the age of the great reptiles comes to an end in a hush. The giant asteroid is seen falling into the sea whose face. 
very quick sequence. Glorious scene of the earth. It, in the beginning, you're like, oh, wow, so pretty, you know, oh, cosmology, oh, so incredible, the universe is so great, so big. He said, looking at it, man, it's, you know, it's, it's also hard. It's beautiful earth. And then suddenly, you see no sound at all. A meteor go in, penetrate the atmosphere, land, boom. Gate, gate, para gate, para sum gate. Gone, gone, really gone, utterly gone. Quiet. The struggle between the twin calls of emptiness and form, grace and nature, is also imagined by Malik as the strife between fluidity and aridity, plenty and paucity, water and desert. So the most difficult film to talk someone through, because they really have no idea what to make of it, is the concluding sequence when they're in the desert. Like, what the hell is this? Are they in heaven? I don't know. I mean, I like mono desert. I like the Bonneville salt. <laughs> I don't think I'm like the Bonneville salt plants going, a place much like heaven. <laughs> what kind of heaven would that be? They were like, ah, I don't know what's going on. They're in heaven. No. They're in the desert. Desert is a place of nature. First of all, you want to know what nature is? Try to be graceful in desert. It really hot. It's not hospitable to human life. It's got all kinds of horrible, poisonous, biting things. You know, <laughs> it's the, the loaded. I mean, it's in part of Death Valley, Bonneville Salt Flats, Mono Lake, all this below sea level. So they are really, really hot and death like. And what are they full? They're full of the dead. But how are the dead always living among us? Because we live in the desert. The dead don't go away. Because the desert is, the dead will always be with us. That we're not great. We don't just say, oh, bye-bye, dead people. Easy come, easy go. It's not. First of all, easy come, easy go. You will have nothing in your life. Life will go right, flash you right by. You've got to love it. But if you love it, I think of Gary Snyder's last poem, The Death of His Wife, Carol Coda. You know, as he's incinerating her body, he's devastated. Worth every attachment. That's the line of the desert. They go into the desert seeking water, seeking grace, seeking peace with the dead. <clears throat> you know, uh, the sequence is shot in locations Death Valley, Mono Lake. As he walks among the ghosts of the dead whose memory. Uh, and being are kept alive by mourning. It is to the soundtrack of Agnes Dei, the Berlioz's Requiem. So again, the three great sequences in the film were all punctuated by the music of the funeral. And the Agnes Dei, of course, that's the moment in the funeral where we attempt to get some water in the desert of our lacrimosa. To be able to say, as Jack's mother is imagined to be saying, I give him to you. As he gives the memory of his son to the sea, to grace. I mean, grace is also, think of it, I mean, you know, it's, it's an awesome thought. You want to see a scene of grace? It's the meteor dropping onto the planet and the, the fifth great extinction event. It all goes back into the sea of Genesis, the sea of the coming. As if it never were, except for a few fossilized remains for the paleontologists to look at and say, huh, I wonder what that was like back then. So the Agnes Day of the point of the funeral where we attempt to make our peace with nature and yield to the grace and acceptance and affirm law. Yes, this is a scene of expiation, but it is the expiation in which the funeral weeping that begins the film comes to accept death itself. Remember, whose memories are this? They're all Jack's. Jack O'Brien. Oh, by the way, did you ever think what the acronym of Jack O'Brien is? 
Jack O'Brien, J-O-B, Job. To Job's memories. They're involuntary. And what is the secret they began with it? Of course, this is Yahweh's speech. Remember, all the great monsters that he spoke of, they were also of the sea, of the water. And where is every one of the dinosaurs? One's on the beach, the other's are in the streams. Where were you at the dawn of creation? You know, as in the argument against Job is not all the people who keep trying to say it's okay. The argument is create the doorway of creation itself. The desert meets the water. Mrs. O'Brien is heard saying, I give him to you. I give you my son. This is no less than Job retracting his rebellion and like Iosha, watering the earth with his tears of gratitude. Now remember, Sosama said to Iosha, look, you're a kid. You'll never get this. But when you do, there will be a sign. And what is the sign? You fall down to the earth and water it with your tears of gratitude. When you do that, you'll know what religion is. Until then, it's just rebellion. <clears throat> I knew you, Job says at the very end. I knew you, but only by rumor. So you can see also, this is what Jack's, all of Jack's comments from the beginning of the film. You know, where were you? How did you come to me? Job, I knew you, but only by rumor. My eye has beheld you today. I retract. I even take comfort for dust and ashes. If life be bones, thank you very much. Mourning is the journey through the desert in search of lost water. It is a vision of the lifting of the agony of division. Last thought, I'm just super close to being done. Just as the film begins and ends with the image of a flame, the adult Jack O'Brien um, uh, frames the involuntary flood of memory that is mourning. This framing of our mourning, this con concentration and expiation of its forces is the ritual of the funeral and the whole film follows the mournful expiatory logic of this ritual. The film with its remarkable soundscape begins with funeral music and the call of the sea. And is a little later, Yet his father Haynes, the, 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 the priest in the film, gives a sermon. Remember this? What was the sermon on? Book of Job. Hmm, very interesting. He asks, Does not also he see God who sees God turn his back? Now, that's the hard thought. We all love the face of God. Who among us dares love the back of God. We know that Malik himself saw God turn his back because he had his own RL to mourn. This is from a report of Malik's life. That's what LR is a character. Malik's brother is Larry. Larry, the youngest, went to Spain to study the guitar with the virtuoso Segovia. Uh, Terry discovered in the summer of 1968 that Terry had broken his own hand, seemingly despondent over his progress. The true story. So remember, the character is the one his father is always pushing with the music. Um, but you see, it's one of the most beautiful sequences in the film. This is the secret of Malik. Once you get what is going on, these scenes are so concentrated, they're almost unbearable. They're so full of life and motion grief and joy. And the sequence is, knowing everything in the film, you watch it again, it's a sequence, no comment, no nothing but the story, it's just his father playing the piano. And his son, who will later commit suicide, based on Malik's own brother, 
who went to study guitar in Spain with Segovia, he's accompanying the father and they're playing off of each other. Guitar leading piano, piano leading guitar, father and son united in music. So precious, so great, poof, gone also. <clears throat> Emil, Malik's father, concerned, went to Spain and returned with Larry's body. It appeared the young man had committed suicide. So remember that opening sequence, the howling of the mother, and then the camera pans around the house, and you see still sitting there in the room is the guitar. It's Malik's mother. This is Malik's funeral for his brother. <clears throat> After R.L.'s death is announced at the beginning of the film, one sees an abandoned guitar, memories of the young, graceful, and innocent R.L. Again, he's also he's the Ayosha character. Of all the brothers, he's the one that always gets the BB gun shot on his finger, the one who's always tricked, the one who's always beat up, the one who people always pick on, the one who's a musician, always doing very unmanly things. Kiss the Ayosha, fragile, the flower too fragile to live in this world. Trusting the world and often thereby being left open to hurt and abuse. How can one explain away the suffering and death of the innocent? One cannot. This is what obsessed Ivan Karamazov as he collected horrible story after horrible story of the cruelty unleashed upon innocent children and animals. I mean, that's what his big thing was. We just collect story. Adults, they got it coming. The kids, they haven't screwed up yet, so they're innocent, like animals. And he just collects stories of all the ways in which we destroy them. I mean, it's interesting to watch Tree of Life in the Age of Trump and to listen to uh, high-ranking people tell us that no mother left without their babies unless they want to leave the babies behind. That the scandal of life enervates any justification of life threatens thereby to make life itself worthless or a trick. <clears throat> the grandmother, for example, played by Fiona Shaw, encapsulates all those who want to put Job's loss into some kind of perspective, and each platitude is galling. So remember she comes right after the funeral, and she's trying to talk down the mother who's on the verge of just suicide. Here are her justifications for going on after the suicide of your son. You still have your memories. Cursed memories. They are the haunting presence of the crushed, precisely as the crushed. They mock us. The pain will pass. All things pass. This is precisely the problem. Life goes on. Again, that is the nub of the problem. It goes on, but in a reckless and with absolute abandon for the living. Nothing stays the same. Unfortunately, that is true. That is why I am weeping. As Father Haynes in his sermon reflects, we vanish as a cloud, we wither as the autumn grass, and like a tree we are rooted up. You still have the other two children. At most funerals, this feeble attempt at consolation gets you decked. No life is substitutable. In the reigning great extinction event, shall we take comfort in the fact that at least we still have our zoos? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. This was the very platitude that Job offered to himself and his wife after the death of their children the destruction of their estate, and his contraction of boils. That is just words. In a few sentences, Job declares to Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, blot out the day I was born. <clears throat> and I'll just conclude here. I've been going on for a while. My last thought here. Nonetheless, Mrs. O'Brien experienced love smiling through all things. Remember, this is also 
the end of uh, um, the Thin Red Line. I mean, really one of the great endings of the film in all cinema history. You know, the helmet of a dead soldier lying on the beach, a little minuscule sapling of a bamboo tree grown out of it, private train, all things shine. Love smiling through all things, but does it smile even through the suffering and death of the innocent? Um, the lacrimosa, but the desert does finally for Malik find its way to the water and mourning finds its way to acceptance. Death itself is for Malik not an argument against the glory of the tree of life, whose shining is like what Paul said of the Messianic. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of all hostility. The film reveals as belonging together without dialectical resolution, but with the healing of the nations, water and desert, the front and back of life, because it is also a tree of life, namely the hidden power of the cinematic image. The front and the back, water and desert. Was this not what Private Train discovered in the thin red line? The thin red line itself holds together opposites and serves as the gateway or passage from one to the other. And this Malik's whole thing, these gate, these passageways. But the great line, my favorite line from the uh, Thin Red Line. I'm going to use it to wrap up. One man looks at a dying bird and thinks there is nothing but unanswered pain. That death's got the final word. It's laughing at him. Another man sees that same bird, feels the glory, feels something smiling through it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very interested in your comments. Mm -hmm. It was so fantastic, not, not least because it recalled so many, it recalled the movie so powerfully in the midst of it, but also the Dostoevsky moments and some of those sorts of things are really pretty overwhelmed. Um, when, I wanted to ask you if you could go into the, uh, you had some sort of um, suggestive remarks about the expiatory expiatory uh, aspect of the obvious day at the end. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was thinking of right, so the, the August day, of course, like you said, it's the moment of grace in the midst of mourning. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, which also recalls um, uh, and I wonder if this was brought up for me when you were playing with desert and water recalls the Isaiah 35 uh, prophecy of the one who will uh, bring sight to the blind, yes. hearing to the deaf, but also waters will gush forth in the desert yes. uh, in the middle of that. Uh, and it just seemed to me that there's, I, I, I'm still wrestling with that scene. I don't know what to make of it quite there at the end. Uh, it's, what I heard you speaking about was a sort of, There's a kind of Job-like resolution, right? There's, there's the, the moment of revelation when sort of one's comportment to life changes as a result of mm -hmm. a kind of initiation into a deeper mystery. Uh, but I wonder if in Malik there isn't even something more than just the Job ending. Whether there's, it seems like there's a difference between Job and the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, right? It's, that's sort of where I'm, where I'm stuck with that. And I feel like in Malik, there's that, there's that tension. Grace, grace bats last. Uh, oh yeah, that's the lot. So, thank you. That's extraordinarily rich. I mean, my, the skeleton of my position really is to track the logic of the film along the logic of the funeral. 
and to try to ask what a funeral tries to do. If you really defend a funeral, and I don't even mean necessarily a Christian funeral, I mean that we memorialize our relationship to the dead in various ways since the beginning. The oldest remnants of human culture have funereal elements. It's our relationship to the dead, it's our relationship to the past, which is a deep experience of nature. By nature, I don't mean, you know, the ecological world, nature in the tempest sense, really of just the hard, fast, rational things as they are. And so the logic of a funeral is the logic of mourning and funeral really is the following gambit. That it's possible if we ritualize it through art and we go right to the heart of the problem. There is a possibility that there is a real difference between mourning and melancholy. And what do I mean by that? You know, remember Freud's famous distinction between mourning and melancholy. In mourning, you can't let go of the lost object. It's always with you. But mourning is the process of trying eventually to be able to let it go, not dismiss it, but to have an experience of grace, which is to say that life is still good. And Mrs. O'Brien thinks even the hardest things in her miserable marriage and all in a lousy Texas town, that life is still good. You know, she's. What an incredible thing to have air to breathe, to have three sons to raise. You know, it was enough, really, until she lost one. You know, and yet somehow in Job's memory, so Jack O'Brien's memory, he is trying to enter into that movement of memory. So his memory begins when first he lights the candle. Because it's the anniversary of R.L.'s death, the clue to that, of course, is his recollection when he's on the phone with his father. They've been fighting over him, you know, no doubt saying, jerk, you're the one, oh, wow, my brother committed suicide. Uh, and then, of course, the morning, you can't let go. It's all coming back. And this is almost the agony of mourning because you don't think like, wow, it's terrible, this scene of them disappearing. The agony of mourning is you just, you miss it all. You can't let go of it all. The little things, the big things, you know, it's almost as if this is the inertia written into the Big Bang. It, just, it holds on to itself. You can't let go of itself. Um, so as all this comes back, the journey into the desert. So the desert really is the place of nature, I think, for Malik. Um, all things are water, but nature is the point in which we experience water at the desert. My image of that was Melville's Moby Dick Ahab, right? He, he's in the sea, his image of infinity, and he thinks he's got nothing. You know, he, he will make his life by punishing that goddamn whale. You know, it showed him he's nothing and nobody. That's life in the desert. And so as Sean Penn goes through on the anniversary of this suicide, it is to go from the desert to the water. And it's at the water that his mother is there and she shows him, this is my son, I give him to you, to the water. Grace, grace would be the moment in which, again, I would say it's a hard reading of Job. I think it probably would not be one that a Talmudic scholar would be super thrilled with. But you know, the hard reading of Job would be, it's a story of grace. It's the moment in which, you know, things just as they are, are worthy of cherishment and love. Even if your life is Job. That's the sea. That's the moment when the desert meets the sea. That's when nature meets grace. Ever, he's always saying, you know, he understands there was a person for whom nature always had the upper hand. He couldn't get over this. He couldn't forgive his father. He couldn't forgive life. You look at him, he's doing what his father never could do. You know, he's, in the extended version of the film, you see he's a womanizer, he's a jerk. Um, you know, everything his father couldn't do, he'll show him. And he can't accept it. 
until he can. Last scene, he's in front. And of course, here's Joe's pit. He's standing in front of his office building in Houston. So a place if I were to find really to say, how do we understand the quiet, subtle way in which we make hell on earth and celebrate it as the triumph of human technology? You know, office buildings. And so here he is in this office building, the this, this, this spiritual squalor. He began to hear the sound of water and the birds and acceptance. Now, remember, I, I began also with the anecdote, I, this is very meaningful to me, from Martin Sheen and how Malik had saved Sheen's life. The brothers come up. This is Dostoevsky's vision also. Religion is not how you get away from life's problems. Religion is the process by which you understand yourself to be the problem. And you return in grace to things just as they are. This was it. This is already is the spiritual triumph. That I'm alive. So again, that's and, and beyond that, what does Malik think? I don't know. He's got a very, very, you know, he goes to Mass. He, he takes his own religion very seriously. But it's a Dostoevsky seriousness. It's, it's also it's a deep reimagining and terrestrializing and humanizing of what these forces are. You know, for him, really, the spiritual problem is we can't live our lives. When push comes to shove, they're unacceptable to us. I remember how Iosha finally made his peace. This is Malik through and through. It's unacceptable. I rebel against the earth. I rebel against the earth. And he goes back to the funeral, and they're chanting the gospel, and they're chanting the wedding at Canaan. And the wedding at Canaan suddenly goes, oh, I, got I suddenly got it. The first miracle was to help us with our happiness. That's the problem. We don't know what we have. We, don't, we can't bear our happiness. We're in the sea, and we imagine that we're in the desert. We're on this earth, and we think it's not enough. Let's just carve it up, and if it destroys us, well, it's okay because we've got to carve it up anyway, because it's got to be what we need it to be. The sense that I'm nothing. The despair of the human condition today, I would say, really, this is a good time for Malik films, because, you know, we are running from our own feelings of nothingness at an unprecedented pace. Yeah, and soon it was to help us with our happiness. At this moment, Osha goes out, and he falls to the earth, and he waters them with his tears of gratitude. Malik also loved Holdley, the great poet. I love the line from Bread and Wine. Heavy to bear our sadness, but the heaviest to bear of all our happiness. That for Malik is the religious problem. That's the nub of the spiritual. I began with this little, yeah, I don't know, I'm totally, uh, I, I was like the Buddha Dharma. I began with a, a little epigram I didn't want to bring in because it seemed really off the base, but your question really brings it up with the famous um, tenth and concluding verse of the Oxford poems. I really think, in a very special Chinese way, it's Malik's thought. So at the very end, and this process has moved itself all the way to the end. No immortal powers, no secret spells, just teach the withered trees to bloom. That was a tree of life. Just teach the withered trees to bloom. Please. Yes. Well, oh, that's powerful. Um, so, I mean, this whole presentation, thank you. Uh, so what's become real for me, what you just said, is the, the dead. Um, yeah. um, a 
lot of the work that I've done recently, I just had, it's like a synchronicity because I'm a clinical social worker and I was just working with a woman a few days ago, 19 years old, who um, something just unbelievably devastating has happened. And this has been my work. I see it. It comes in front of me. Where her, she had a three-month-old baby boy, and um, she allowed a, a friend who was a heroin addict to take care of her. And they found him with a blunt force trauma dead. And this happened two years ago. And so she's, her life is basically ended and she's 19 years old. She's living with that. And so, and so I, I bring that here because I mean, it's something that I have to protect myself from. But your whole talk, you know, just there's a reason that I came here, you know. Um, I came from, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I just heard about this talk and came, but I mean, there was other things that, how can I, you know, find the, the water of life <clears throat> when when that baby boy is, is with me now. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and the, the thought that Plato said, well, all the philosophy is just getting ready to, to do that. Preparation for death. That's, that's yeah, I know. Um, I always love something Oscar Wilde once said. It really wasn't the job of religion to take an interesting thief and turn him into a boring Christian. You know, that it really should have been the great issues. That's what makes Malik cinema so extraordinary because it's not just sermonizing about them, it's the force, the down to the cosmic level of these hard things. I mean, that image really of why there is something rather than nothing. You know, this new film, The, um, the, the Voyage of Time, a documentary about being, you know, a movie who's about ontology. Why there is something rather than nothing. And the lacrimosa. And really the moment in which you see that this is the struggle between grace and nature. And the very idea of being. That to be aware of being is to be at the point in which the real problem is, no matter what it is, I risk always being able, be unable to affirm any of it because what I've experienced of some of it. How do we bear this? How do we bear our wounds? I mean, it, you know, Malik really thinks that cinema is about healing. But you can't heal by not giving the devil a due by not giving the rebel their due. But that's what I always loved about Dostoevsky. His absolute respect for Ibai, not think is in a crazy position. You know, this really is an incredible articulation of the struggle of every human being as they confront their lives. Why don't you just turn the ticket back in? What Schopenhauer once said, you know, I don't know what happened to him when his early age, but you know, a very dramatic moment in philosophy, he says, now, life is an enterprise that does not cover its costs. <laughs> you know, it's to not know what that is and not to see that this belongs authentically to spiritual practice all over the world. This is one of the spiritual problems. You know, we can answer this magically, you know, by just telling us that it's not real. Those tests came out, it's real. And grace is to be able to accept things, to affirm things for what they are. That's the tree of life. I will have known life 
for what it is. I love it till the end of days. That's hard. That's, that's, the, that's the problem of our happiness. We don't know how to love what we have. And the pain is real. And, you know, part of it, too, you know, it's interesting. You know, the film really has an amazing time scale on it. Big Bang, childhood, and then, you know, Jack O'Brien's contemporary life right now. And on every register, it's the movement in which, you know, what's, how does the, how, what's the opening, you know, uh, Opening of the film, you know, where were you when I created the earth? Where were you when I created something and they, they shouted for joy? Or I have a little other part in here that I, I mercifully didn't read for everyone, so it might have been too much, but, you know, I was really struck by someone else who was struggling with this, and that was the great Italian philosopher, Atan Degri. Spent his whole life struggling against capitalism, really fighting for just economic, sane life on this earth. And I think no rational person thinks of any hope that will ever live sanely economically, honestly. It's overwhelming. And of course you fight it, and of course it just, you know, it's like saying, you know, I'm gonna go home, but just jump around the window every night. You know, I find to go home every night that way. So, yeah, we all know it's insane. And so he's looking at his life, he just wants to give up. Spent a huge portion of life in prison. He can never go back to Italy. Uh, only graduate students read the books and, you know, they say unintelligible things about them. And, he just, ah. and suddenly he says, you know, I missed the point. I look at capitalism like it's Auschwitz. I look at capitalism like it's genocide. I see all of its damage, but my response was wrong. I scream at it. As if screaming at it, I was going to change something. Job's thought, he quotes Negri, I can't believe it. Negri quotes Thomas Aquinas. The thought was in a Christian register to love the world the way that God loves the world. That was the gist of Yahweh's speech to Job. Now, remember, Job, Yahweh comes down, first of all, and says, rationally, you're right. These people trying to talk you out of what you know are wrong. So he chastises all these idiots trying to say, oh, he must have done something wrong, he must have offended God, there must be some reason for this. You know, does he really deal with what you've done? No. You've done nothing to deserve it. You're not being punished. You've not, you haven't done anything to deserve this. You're right. But the answer was not, you know, to say that. How do we love the world the way that God loves the world? Holds it. Wants it to be. You know, it wants it to see what it has. Look what you, you're right, but look what you have. Look who you are. The Big Bang is the Odyssey, but the Odyssey is simply not, not making pain and suffering go away. Look, study cosmology. Look who you are. And realize that that is a spiritual problem. Learn to shout with joy. Learn to water the earth with your tears of gratitude. Now, to make a film about that and use Hollywood money, including some of Brad Pitt's money, I'm sure Brad Pitt had no idea what the film was about that he was in, but he gave money for it, a lot of his own money. God bless it, you know, I mean, every time we think we've lost, you know, something like Malad comes along. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Jason, just one little tiny question. I love everybody. Awesome. But you, you mentioned mourning and melancholy, and yes. maybe I got wrapped up. In yeah, I, I, that point drifted away. I didn't finish that point. Okay. Yeah, so remember, mourning for, for uh, uh, Freud was the persistence of a lost object as you slowly, painfully come to the ocean, as you come to the point, and he didn't use the word ocean, that's my metaphor for Malik, um, as you begin to accept the loss, but along the interim, it's as if the dead are no longer dead. 
You experience them as a lie. They're with you all the time, involuntarily. You know, like Hamlet, you know, you know, uh, the time is out of joint. My father is dead, but he won't stay in the past. He's here. You know, I, I can't let him be what he is, which is no longer here. You know, you have an ill will to the past, he's told. That's how it is. That's mourning. To try to get to the point in which the past can be the past. To forgive. This is really the deep ontology of forgiveness. To let the past be the past. You know, to, to, to be present to life right now by accepting ill and harm and injury and disappointment. Melancholy, on the other hand, is the failure of mourning. For Freud, the melancholic, can't make this movement. You know, it's perpetual mourning. It's the point in which, because I have lost, I know only loss. I experience only loss. And next thing you know, like Durr, you know, in the famous melancholia uh, drawing in which you know, the globe lies there, and the tools all lie there, and the books all lie there in a heap, and it stares off, and none of it makes a damn bit of difference. You know, an anhedonic depression in which, you know, pain has driven me from being able to feel anything else. It monopolizes, and so I know only the lost object. A religion would be to help it with our happiness. That is... To love the lost object, acknowledge the lost object, but eventually be able to make our peace. The lacrimosa. Yes, how happy we are. But you know, that doesn't mean anything Pollyannish. That's also unspeakable things. I mean, that magnificent scene again, to me, this the sublime devastation of death in passing as if and it, you know you really get the feeling from a cosmological point of view it's absolutely nothing to the universe that in a single accident cosmic accident the age of the great reptiles are gone it's nothing you ever said the oops my bad <laughs> can i clean up the mess it made no difference whatsoever but but you know, you know, to experience what life is, to love it. You know, there's no way that you're going to be able to say, I look at it as the universe does, as if it's nothing. If it's nothing, your life flashes you by. If it's something, you're dead or you're religious. And we have cinema. Not to tell us that. To let that register in a cinematically ontological register so that we're not melancholic. Mourning is also a way by which we struggle with what we have. That we've loved. That we had someone to love. That we were able to love. I'm just I'm in the film think of the one scene where the, the dinosaur and he comes up and he puts his paw on yeah. the, the, the dinosaur's head and I'm expecting him just to kill it or something and, but it wanders off but you know I think anybody who works with non-human animals knows not that you know the dinosaur made a moral and that's just anthropocentric thinking but you know I mean Animals that raise little babies that aren't even their own species. Um, you know, it's complicated. The immense cooperation among animals for, for mutual aid. It's complicated. I mean, the part of the lacrimosa, and of course, here's the thing too, the lacrimosa, you know, with, with, with Presner having lost his, his best friend ever. I mean, they worked everything every single 
Kislowski film and the Prisoner soundtrack, and they're all magnificent. And then his last great work is the you know, uh, Requiem for Friends, what the whole mass is called. Um, you know, it's horrible and it's beautiful. The creation scene is one of the most stunning set of images ever, and it's mournful and it's glorious. And there is the spiritual problem in his nub. Please. Um, and my mind is just swimming with so much. So I'm trying to distill a reflection and a question for you. Um, but thank you for, for what you've shared with us. I can't help but view the film through a, um, the lens of process theology and, mm -hmm. and Whitehead's understanding of God as the fellow sufferer who understands. Yeah. And in watching the film, I, I continue to, to try to understand what, um, what's Malick's theology around creation as something that um, God chose freely, creation as some kind of catastrophe in the nature of God, and that God is involved in the creation in a way that um, you know, as, as a Whiteheadian theologian would say, God suffers with us. Yes. And I can't quite tell in, in Malick's films whether he's, you know, in the technical term, a panentheist, yes. or um, and, and he seems to be Catholic, but what, in what way is he understanding God's relationship to the world, to this, um, you know, thermodynamic entropic process of creativity with great loss along the way and pain and suffering is is the divine somehow caught up in that yeah. or not it's a deep question i mean i come at that from a few angles in a way of course i mean this kind of process Moltmannian, dostoevsky and you know, Moltmann love dostoevsky you know this you know, god's love is god love the world not that stand as a firm architect, you know, who's made some kind of machine. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could get that if you were so inclined and the film could inspire you to have those thoughts, but it's not contingent upon being committed to those thoughts. Because the first thing that's striking with this film is very elemental. It's a film. And therefore its force is not a theological force. It's not trying to discursively to try to make sense of theology. It is to, how shall we say, present the power of our happiness in the pit. Not prevent an idea, present an idea of it. To make it palpable. Do what only cinema could do. So in a way, this is kind of a cinema theology, I don't know, or a theocinemology or Theo cinema, like that. And in a way, God is present by understanding the logic of the capacity of cinematic art. But is that at first as cinema, first and foremost as cinema, as soon as you say it theologically, you know, I think that's a good direction to go. I, from everything that we know about Malik, I think he thinks in those sorts of directions. Um, but they're also just the side door. Power of his simply is the film. The nub of the spiritual life is present in cinematic terms. It's suddenly, and it's clear, to see the water coming out of your faucet as a different person. That's all it is. Now you could go Moltmanni and try to make that sound less eccentric as it does as i say it right now about the context of the film it just sounds like you're mad you know like you know wow a goldfish swimming in a bowl of water wow man I'll, i can die now it would just sound crazy but cinema is really there you begin to be able to sense <coughs> elementally and the elements of how he puts it together the sadness and it really, the thought of God is not you know, a commitment to a being called God. I mean, in a way, I would say if I were to push 
uh, Malik philosophically and theologically. Uh, he would be a radical Christian in kind of the Thomas Altizer sense, death of God theology. So no commitment to a being called God. But rather, religion is something subtler than that. You know, it's what it is simply to be present to things just as they are. You know, it's to go through that threshold in which the water coming from your faucet is not just the water coming from your faucet. You know, that I'll say this, you know, Dostoevsky and Malhav taught me two things. Every time I hear seagulls, which you know, I live in Seattle, born in San Francisco, I've heard seagulls my whole life. Um, damn. But my brother's a photographer. You know, just to look at things just as they are is enough. So long as we begin to see more clearly. Yeah. Reminds me of in the thin red line on the great in the battle scene on the hill when all of a sudden it, the camera cuts to a grasshopper on a blade of grass. Yeah. Or the bats. And I love too, you know, is here as we fight war, and of course, from Malik, what is war? It is the absolute folly that we could unleash the dog of war as if that were a rational response to anything. To release madness as a rational way of solving a problem. And you see the whole earth looking at us. The bats, the lizards, the insects. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, that just really suddenly starts to you know, thin red line. You know, I remember I was nominated for all those Academy Awards. I kept saying, oh, it's like Saving Private Ryan. No. Um, <laughs> you know, it's an anti-war film. I, I, it's not pro-war, if that's what you mean. But, you know, it's not really about whether war is a good or a bad thing. It takes it as a fact and treats it as a spiritual problem par excellence. Earth simply looking at us in our madness. It's a spiritual moment. Imagine if we could talk to a chimpanzee, what they would think about even San Francisco. That's all you need, you know, really just the powers is what he's, he's capturing. You know, I think like, for example, you think it was uh, the, uh, the New World. That is a film that I dare you to watch 10 times. Because the more you watch it, the more you realize that the sadness it holds, the meeting of two disparate cultures, which we all know was absolute disaster. It's never a foregone conclusion. Disaster is never a foregone conclusion meeting other people. It never is. It didn't have to be that. And the, the incredible Sadness is able to marshal at a very spiritual level. How are we to the earth? So, I mean, there is panentheism. I mean, I, that's all true. But I think as a theory, it's good, but it's abstract. The wind on your face. Wind on your face is Malik's proof for God's existence. That's all you need. And then, by that, I don't mean there's something beyond the wind on your face. Just to really experience the wind on your face was all you ever needed religion to be. We'll call it God who we really respect being able to see how happy we are. To shout for joy, as in the Job quote that begins the film. How How is... Uh thinking and feeling cinematically affected how you write about philosophy. Yeah, you know, Malik's a great teacher in this because he began as a philosopher. Now that has led to one very terrible rabbit hole. Everyone just kind of just stuffs Heidegger and everything he does, you know, makes it like illustration of Heidegger. It's a terrible idea. If he wanted to write about Heidegger, he would continue to write about Heidegger. He already did that, he did a good job. And that's what it looks like. Why make Badlands? You know, I mean, we read Being in Time. You know, he, he could have written a book about Being in Time. That was the point. So, really, it's someone who, does, who thinks deeply like a philosopher, 
who has a cinema that puts him in a very rare class of directors. That class of directors are that small number of people whose fundamental instinct was to explore the full power of cinema. And I've always been struck by something Deleuze said about cinema. It's, I take it to the bank. You know, when cinema was discovered, it is potentially the most powerful art form that we have. And it is paradoxically the most maligned. We have not done to painting, despite all the Thomas Kincaid and Norman Rockwell in the world, <laughs> we have not done to painting, we have done to cinema. We have not done this to poetry, despite Rob McEwen. <laughs> no, maybe we have done, I don't know. You know there's a lot of great poetry, the unbalance of poetry is good. But, you know, a lot of academics in here, a lot of students in here, all know the academic world. It took years to even get schools to admit that cinema could be an academic subject. Because we all knew the most powerful art form, we always associate with what it was 99% of the time, which is something that's not even worthy of a college level discussion. Is a problem, is a, you know, that's insane. So Deleuze, you know, cinema could be the reason why Hitler watched Metropolis every morning. He knew that cinema, if you use it, as, if you weaponize it, as Hollywood does, you have mind control, you can mobilize the masses. Trump America is a total nightmare of a weaponized mass media that takes the power of these things and uses them for bad effects. So Blues' line was, Hollywood Hitler, Hitler Hollywood. Now that's the challenge. Now Malik belongs to that class who thinks, wait a minute, talk about our happiness. We've got cinema. And you watch what Malik does with cinema. One, think deeply about its soundscape. Do not assume that the soundscape is merely a background element. The use of music, the use of voiceovers, the voiceovers are not a background element telling you we don't understand the foreground. And that is an idiotic statement. You know, great music and poetry. Poetry itself, is all, Malik is a voracious listener of classical music, a voracious reader of poetry. You know, you can study the, the tradition. You see a lot of the dialogue comes from the uh, tradition of poetry, from the tradition of works of philosophy. Um, use of the camera. What is it to take seriously the role of light in cinema? Now, Malik's the absolute master of that. You know, it's almost the point which, what is it to think cinematically what John Turner think about, discovered in painting? That God is light. To unleash that light. You know, why does the film have to be narratival? How do we advance the logic of cinematic thinking simply by confusing it with me telling you a story? You could do that, but why? You don't need cinema to tell a story. I can sit there and tell you a story. What is it to communicate something as deep as anything you find in philosophy? And an absolute transformative nub. I mean, you know, Malik, like Tarkovsky, the you know, job of cinema really is to shape you to your core and open you up for the good. To open you up to your own life. You don't do that by telling someone a story. And if you want to tell someone a story, why make it a cinematic story? Sound, image, light, music. Performers all hate Malik because they put all these incredible performances in there and half of them don't make the film or <laughs> they drown out their dramatic hysterical acting, you know, quit little whispering voiceover when the actress fears she's screaming in a fight and so they'll whisper, why? <laughs> it's extraordinary. So I would say, okay, philosophically, first thing you should do with the film is think, what can only cinema do? But then do it cinematically. 
philosophical thought is about what I'm trying to do. It's not doing it. And then when you think philosophically about something who has done that, don't assume that they're illustrating philosophy. Philosophy becomes how we learn to speak about what we're seeing. But we're not decoding it. It's not a stealth philosophical treatise that you're trying to decrypt. You know, as if, if philosophy was just some little pill that brought in the bitter medicine. Oh God, you know, I refuse to read those boring philosophy books. Oh, now it snuck it into a movie. It's not that at all. It's of supreme interest philosophically, but Malik, who can make an argument the best, is not presenting an argument in his film. He's harrowing your soul. And I think too, you know, academic philosophy has suffered this deformation, in my opinion. It's confused one of its powers, which is discursive athleticism, carefulness of reading, uh, lightness on your intellectual toes, with philosophy as a way of life. Philosophy is a deep life practice. You know, you know not simply, you know, when it, as you're at a funeral and you start quoting Wittgenstein, you know, it really, I think that really shows us the limits of how we relate to philosophy. And what did Iosha's kiss mean? I think you can talk about it, but it's not, you know, a stand-in for an argument. It's meant what it is. To help us with our happiness. To sunder to, to, to desunder division. to heal our relationship to life, to bring us back in. Anything else? Thanks. All right, got it. So thank you, I had a good time to stop. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.